This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. I want to welcome you back to our study of First and Second Thessalonians. My name's Dan Cates. As we've been studying together, I've been using the King James Version of the Bible. We continue in our study in 1 Thessalonians 5. We noticed verses 1 and 2. We went ahead and read through verse 8 in our last class session. We want to pick up where we left off in thought, though, as we enter into verse 3. We're talking about the first and second, or the uh, second coming, rather, and the expectation of the second coming. Verse 3 says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. For when they... When we were looking at chapter 4, we saw a contrast between the we who were the Christians who would be able to meet the Lord in the air at the second coming and the they that were without in verse 12 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Those without are the they here in verse 3. Those who are outside of Christ are going to wake up every day, even the day that Jesus is going to return, and they're going to say, today's just a day like any other. Let's go ahead and go about our business. This isn't going to be a special day. The reason they're going to say that the day that Jesus returns is there's nothing to indicate this is the day. There are no signs that say Jesus is returning on such and such day in such and such year. And so when these say, or these are saying, the American Standard has are saying, giving a little bit more of a uh, continual action than shall say. When the worldly are saying peace and safety, thinking everything's fine, like the city of Sardis when Heroides is telling Cyrus and his troops, we can go up and we can take the city. It's at that point, then, sudden destruction cometh upon them. What sort of destruction? Destruction as travail, sorrow, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The idea of Hosea 13.13. Jeremiah 6, 14 spoke about prophesies who, prophe, prophe, uh, prophets who prophesied peace, peace, when there was no peace. Well, people aren't going to be looking for Jesus when he comes. The righteous, therefore, need to be prepared since they don't know when Christ will return. Verse 4, Paul continues that contrast between those that are without and we who are Christians. He said, but ye, he's talking to the congregation at Thessalonica, really to Christians in general, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness. In other words, we're not going to be simply saying peace, peace. We're going to be prepared. You're not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Let's think about having a house, and this house we... Uh, have in it some possessions that we really want to protect, that we are concerned that somebody might break in and steal them. A thief isn't going to call ahead and say, uh, yes, tonight I'm going to be breaking into your house about 2 o'clock in the morning. No, the thief's not going to do that. The one who recognizes that he has these possessions and understands that the dangers out there is going to be prepared knowing that the thief could come tonight, he could come the next night, and so forth. And so that one maybe will have an alert system of some kind. Perhaps that one will be uh, sleeping lightly in case the, the thief comes this particular evening. The one who doesn't appreciate the value of what he has in the house or the reality that a thief could come to his house, he's not going to be concerned about watching for the thief. He's not going to be concerned about investing in some security. He's not going to be concerned about locking his doors, about being prepared in case tonight is the night. The difference is not the matter of timing, 
because the thief could come whenever. The difference is the matter of preparation. The one who sees that he has that of value which the thief would want says, I'm going to protect it. I'm going to be prepared. The other one says, no, everything's perfectly fine. My goods are here tonight. They'll be here in the morning. They'll be here the next day. They'll be here the next day. I'm going to have them for the rest of my life. Difference is the preparation. Matthew 24, 42 through 44, preparation. The word watch in Matthew 24 really carries the idea of being prepared, not looking for signs, but being ready. Why are we not in darkness? Well, verse 5, Paul says, Ye are all the children of light. We're not in darkness because we're in light. We're children of the day. We're children of God. We are not in the darkness. We are of the one who provides the spiritual light, the one who created the physical light. We are not of the night. We're not ones whose deeds take place in the night so that they won't be exposed. We are not of darkness. Light is spoken of in Matthew 5, 14. There the Christian is to be uh, ser serving as a light. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine. Luke 16, 8, Ephesians 5, 8. Darkness is spoken of in Colossians 1, 30, uh, 1, 13. 1 Peter 2, 9, darkness is the state of those who are lost, those who are in ignorance, those who are trying to conceal their wickedness. 1 John 1, 5 and following contrast light and darkness very well. Here ye are all the children of light. For the children of light, our deeds are not going to be done in darkness, and we are going to be prepared when Christ comes. Therefore, let us not sleep. Now the word sleep here and the word sleep in the next uh, verse, repeated twice there, is a different word than the word sleep, which we saw back in chapter 4, verse 15. That word meant sleep or be dead. This one means to be asleep. This is uh, kathudo. So this really is just sleeping. Therefore, let us not sleep. One who is sleeping is not prepared. One who is sleeping is uh, maybe dreaming off, off in some far-off land in his mind. He's not paying attention to his surroundings. How many of us, when we are physically asleep, will hear a noise and will wake up and will be disoriented? I remember one time when my daughter was very young. Uh, she was perhaps three years old. She cried in her bedroom, and it was about two or three in the morning. So I heard her crying. I sprung up from bed, and I took off running toward her room. I was a relatively new father. She was just three. And about the time I got to the doorway of, of my room, I hit the door that was halfway open, and I just fell flat. You see, I, I wasn't really paying attention to my surroundings because I was asleep. I was unaware. In a figurative sense, people are asleep. They are spiritually asleep. They're unrighteous. They're not prepared for what the world ultimately is going to end with, the second coming of Christ. Let us not sleep, not be in this situation, as do others. But let us watch, there's the idea from Matthew 24, be aware, be prepared, and be sober. The word sober means serious or clear-headed. In other words, not off in some dreamland spiritually. Remember in Judges 7, verses 19 to 24, that God had instructed Gideon to narrow his army, and Gideon's army was narrowed from uh, 32,000 to 10,000, and then God wanted it to be narrowed yet further because he wanted to demonstrate that victory was not in the strength of men but in the strength of God. And so Gideon narrowed the number further to 300. How did he do that? Well, those verses record that they went to the riverbank and he watched these soldiers fight. 
uh, or drink rather. As these soldiers drank, he noticed that there were two different postures. Some would go and would lean on both knees down into the water and would pull the water uh, up to their mouth, which wasn't too far from it, unaware of their surroundings. Others would go to the river bank and they would get down on a knee and they would have their heads still up and they would lift the water up higher to where their mouths were so that they could be seeing. They were aware, they were prepared spiritually. The Lord's army doesn't need to be down on its knees with its mouth down in the water. It needs to be up lifting that water to its mouth so that it can be watchful for the enemies around and ultimately watchful for the second coming of Christ. Why is that? For they that sleep, those that are unaware, are unaware in the night. Well, that's where the wicked are. The righteous are in the light. They that are asleep, or they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Think about those that are drunk. Do they have their senses together? Or are they having their senses dulled? Imagine if you have this house and the owner happens to be awake when the thief breaks in, but the owner's too drunk to respond. The owner's too drunk to stop the thief. Well, the senses should have been exercised and prepared to be watchful. Ephesians 5, 14 and following all the way down through verse 18. Paul concludes this section there in verse 8, but let us, let the Christians, but let us who are of the day, okay, we're children of light, verse 5, be sober, be serious, be uh, prepared. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Now, this reminds us of Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, Paul wrote to that church saying that there was a spiritual battle in which we are engaged, not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places, against Satan and his forces. And he pictures there the armor that the Christian needs to wear, not physical armor, but spiritual armor. Among the pieces of that armor were the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. These two things are mentioned again here in 1 Thessalonians, but they're worded a little differently. The breastplate is spoken of as a breastplate of faith and love there in verse 8. Well, faith and love certainly would both be aspects of righteousness. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, we saw the helmet of salvation. Here, that's worded a little bit differently as well. And for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Salvation is something that we desire, and salvation is something that we can expect, but only if we are righteous. So we're reminded of Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, as we read verse 8, and also reminded of our enemy, 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan, who seeks whom he may devour. Let's continue then into verses 9 through 11. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Aren't there some important things here in verses 9 through 11? Paul here is reiterating the fact that salvation awaits the faithful. Now he says whether we are awake or asleep. The word sleep here goes back to the way that sleep was used in chapter 4. Whether we are alive or dead. Okay, so the sleep here is not the sleep of verses 6 and 7. It's the sleep of 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Now let's look more closely at these three verses. First of all, in verse 9, God hath appointed us. Us. He's talking to Christians. He hath appointed, not appointed us, 
to wrath. What that means is, is he has appointed those who aren't Christians to wrath, those who were without hope back in verse 12 of the last chapter or verse uh, 13 of the last chapter have been appointed to wrath. He hath not uh, appointed us to wrath, but to obtain. Okay, we are appointed to obtain. Now let's think about that word obtain for just a moment. If you obtain something, you have to put forth an effort to receive it. If you obtain a, uh, a coin of some kind, then you've sought that coin. You, you've tried to lay hands on that coin, and ultimately you've been able to get your hands on it. You have obtained it. That's the same way with salvation. How can you obtain something if you automatically are given it? Well, this is against the idea that all men are going to be saved. There's a doctrine called universalism that says that God is going to save everyone. No, he's not going to save everyone. He's going to save those who have obtained salvation through their obedience to his commands. That's where his grace is going to be shown. That grace is going to be shown by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Remember John 3, 16. God sent his son. Why? So that they who believe, they who obey might be saved. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, whether we are alive or whether we're dead. Remember what he had said in, verse four, uh, in uh, chapter 4. When Jesus returns, the righteous are going to meet him in the air. The dead are going to rise first. Then we which are alive shall meet them, be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So we should live together with him. I want you to remember that early in the book we talked about assurance. Here we see that the resurrection is assured. Continuing in verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Remember how he had closed 1 Thessalonians 4, 18? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here we see that idea again. Comfort yourselves together. Who is the yourselves? Christians. There's no comfort for the non-Christian. No comfort for the one who's outside of Christ. Comfort yourselves together. Exhort one another, the American Standard says. But then it goes further, and edify, strengthen one another. American Standard says, build each other up. Very good reading for the word edify. Even as also ye do. Remember he had said, touching brotherly love, ye have no need that I write unto you. Well, they already do this as well. Let's go now into verses 12 and 13. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. In verses 12 and 13, Paul urged the brethren to know and to honor and to love those who labored among them and to be at peace with each other. Well, let's think more in depth of these verses. He says, know them. Well, 1 John 4, 1. We can also tie to that thought what we're going to see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Prove all things. Proving all things includes proving those that are among you, those that are working with you, those that are overseeing you. Know them. Which people are the them? Well, Paul gives two categories. Those which labor among you and are over you. It may be the case that you're watching this video and you're not a preacher. You're not a missionary. You are just one who wants to know what the will of the Lord is. 
Do you know that what you're being taught is what Scripture says? Have you proven that what you're being taught is according to this word, not something which has originated with some man? We have the responsibility not simply to accept what we're taught without any reflection or personal study or comparing what we learn to what we read in Scripture, but rather we need to be like the Bereans. Remember, after he left Thessalonica, Paul went to Berea. And they were more noble even than those in Thessalonica because they would take the things which they heard and they would see that those things were so. They would compare them with the Scriptures. Paul was telling the Thessalonians here that you need to know them. You need to make sure that these that bring you messages are really bringing you messages from God. What about those that are over you? Now, in a biblical sense... The New Testament church, and we've stressed this, has the members and then in the local congregation, elders. There's no further hierarchy of a human nature. The only thing higher than that is God himself with Christ being the head of the church. Paul instructs the church, know them which are over you in the Lord. It may be the case that you're a member of the Lord's church, but you don't really know those who are, uh, those who are watching for your souls. You don't know if they're really striving to feed you the pure food of God's word, but you need to know them. You need to prove them. Taking that a step farther, it may be the case that you're watching this video and you're not a member of the Lord's Church. You may be a member of some denomination. Do you know the people that are over you? Are the people who are pointing this group of which you're a member in different uh, directions doctrinally, are, are they teaching doctrines that come from God? Or are you in a group where you're being taught a doctrine which originated over in some city 300 miles away, not in heaven? Know them that are over you. When those that are laboring among you or are over you are preaching the unadulterated doctrine of Christ or are truly concerned for your soul's and are making sure that you are fed the truth, then you do what's found in verse 13, as these brethren were to do. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. There is nothing more valuable on this earth than the person who is preaching the gospel to another person or the person who is serving in the local congregation as one of the multitude of elders or the plurality of elders who is making sure that the local congregation is being taught God's word and it alone. When you're in that situation, esteem, value them. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Very highly for their work's sake. And then that section concludes, and be at peace among yourselves. If there is contention, one could argue there is not Christ. Why is that? Well, Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers. Here, be at peace among yourselves. When Christians are dealing with fellow Christians... When the Thessalonians were dealing with their brethren in Thessalonica, it was incumbent upon them to be at peace among themselves. And for the Lord's church today, there must be peace. And any who are at peace with God necessarily must be at peace with each other. As we continue in this chapter... We get to verses 14 to 22, 
in our looking forward to this book and noticing some of the keys of this book, this was one of our key passages. In the Roman Empire, when Rome would take over a location, it would post instructions, and this reads sort of like that. Let's read verses 14 through 22. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. These are a list of pithy instructions that the Thessalonians needed to follow the same way they might need to follow the, the instructions which have been posted in their community by their Roman rulers. Let's break this down and notice these instructions in a little bit more detail. In verse 14, they are told to warn the unruly. Now we exhort, we've seen exhort a number of times in our study already. Brethren, remember this familiar relationship, Warn them that are unruly. This word unruly is effectively speaking of those who are walking out of step with those who are righteous. 2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. That would be part of this warning the unruly. The American Standard actually, I think, translates this a little bit better. It says admonish, but notice the disorderly. Picture, if you will, an army. An army is in formation, and this army is marching forward. As these soldiers are in rank and file, in lockstep, they're, they're marching, 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 but then let's say that one of the soldiers decides that he's going to go his own direction. What takes place? Well, if he goes off too far in his own direction, he's AWOL, he's absent without leave. In fact, what happens before he can wander off is probably those soldiers who are marching around him nudge him. That they... they push him back into line. They, they might even reach out and, and grab him and put him back in that formation. That's the mental picture that we need to have when we read this first part of this verse because we are the Lord's army marching in lockstep with him if we are righteous. And when any brother starts to be disorderly, that one needs to be admonished, he needs to be warned, and he needs to be put back in line. So that's the first thing which is taking place there in verse 14. The second, these Thessalonians were told to comfort the feeble-minded. Now when we introduced this thought in our introduction, we said that that word feeble-minded was going to be an interesting word and we wanted to focus upon that for a minute. And indeed we do. We're familiar with the idea of comforting. We've seen that four times now in this book comfort or encourage. We've seen it three times just in the past uh, 15 verses. So comfort the feeble-minded. The American Standard says encourage the faint-hearted. And that's, that's an interesting wording as well. But this Greek word actually means the little-souled. Each one of us has a soul. Some of us have souls which are more attuned to truth and more desirous of being obedient than, than others just because we have, we've grown. But then there are those who are little-souled. They don't have the same strength that one who is stronger in the faith has. These need to be comforted, encouraged, so that they can grow 
and be of the same soul as those who are strong. Now we're going to continue with the third of these things in verse 14 in our next class.